There's been a bit of a kerfuffle recently with Qatar Economy Reviews with the famous YouTuber Josh Cahill getting himself banned by Qatar Airways. Now, I don't agree with the way Josh reviewed the airline and I don't agree with the way he handled the fallout. So I'm going to give you my honest and varnished and hopefully balanced opinion from a recent Qatar Airways economy flight. I flew in December 2023 from Melbourne to Doha. I was fortunate to land poor man's business class and have all three economy seats to myself. And although there is an element of luck, I don't think this was purely good for Fortune. So I'm going to give you my tip on how to get this extra space. Hi, I'm Phil and I'm on a great gap year and today I'm leaving the slate grey skies of Melbourne behind. I'm going to go and catch me some sun in Doha. So I've got here a bit early today because I'm trying to scrounge an upgrade off Qatar. Uh, say how much that costs will they let me because I bought the ticket in points. Uh, so it actually gives me a few minutes to talk about Melbourne Airport. Melbourne Airport is a really funny place. Uh, it's got four terminals, but they're all one building. Certainly when they're uh, landside, it's, it's all one building and it's just a bit of an odd thing. So there's Terminal 3, there's Terminal 2, there's the entrances directly next door to each other. And this is the Terminal International Dateline. So that's all that separates Terminal 2 and Terminal 3. And as I walk through the terminals, this is domestic Terminal 3, and now we're walking into international departures in Terminal 2. At Heathrow, if you want to get from Terminal 3 to Terminal 5 on the land side, then you need to either get a tube or a taxi. Well, here, all that separates the four terminals is just a few minutes walk. And Terminals 3 and 4 are domestic terminals, and they're actually connected airside via a tunnel. So if you have a priority pass, then the lounge is in Terminal 4. Uh, and Terminal 4 only has three gates. At the far end of Terminal 2, past the ongoing refurbishment work, are the Qantas International Check-in Desks. Now, I'm not sure if this is actually officially Terminal 1 or Terminal 2, uh, but it does have this interesting warning poster that I haven't seen anywhere else. I think if you're the kind of person to carry explosives in your luggage, you're not the sort of person who's going to be deterred by a poster. Regardless of whether these desks make Terminal 2 or Terminal 1, uh, Terminal 1 proper is just a further short walk away. <laughs> so this is Terminal 1, Qantas domestic departure. Now, I haven't flown from Terminal 1, but it's separate from the other terminals airside. Uh, you can see it's got its own security lane. But I still had to find my check-in desk, uh, which was check-in desk P. L, M, N, O. My check-in desk today is P. Hmm. If I go any further that way, I'm in Terminal 3. Check-in desk P was at the opposite corner of the terminal. I walked past WH Smith's. Through the overspill for another check-in desk, where they thought I was trying to cut the line, past check-in desk D, and finally... And there's P. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, a Fiji flight they're checking in at the moment, so uh, I'm going to have to wait a little while longer. And if you have a landside wait at Melbourne Airport, there's a McDonald's and a coffee shop to the left of that WH Smith's. But there's also this area between Terminals 1 and 2. And if you're looking for a simple meal, I can recommend Grilled. As I suspected, I wasn't able to upgrade because my ticket was a points redemption, but my status did allow me to skip the economy check-in line and jump straight into business check-in. And I was really glad I was able to jump into the business queue because check-in was slow, very slow. It was over four and a half minutes for me as a single passenger, and I only had one bag to check. The main departure area has some nice shops, a reasonable selection of bars and restaurants, and they're all in the centre of this departure lounge area, which creates a, a circuit for you to walk around. Most of the lounges are downstairs from here, but there are two lounges upstairs, and they're the Mahaba Lounge, which serves as the business lounge for Qatar Airways, and the Qantas International First Class Lounge, which I have access to as a BA Gold status holder. And this is a true first class lounge with an a la carte restaurant, but I'll review that in a separate upcoming video. So remember to subscribe, click the bell and get a notification when that video comes out. I'm not usually in any rush to arrive at the gate, but one quirk of the Qantas First Lounge is that it only shows international Qantas flights on its departure board. So I had to rely on the reception staff to give me the nod on when to go to the gate. Uh, and I arrived at the gate just as business and status holders were boarding. Hiya. Hi, welcome on board, Mr. Philippe. Thank you, cheers. Bye. 
And our aircraft today is a Boeing 777-300ER. It has two Q-suite cabins at the front and then three economy cabins in a 343 configuration. I booked the points redemption through British Airways and it cost me 35,000 Avios one way from Melbourne to Doha, which is high if you consider it's 45,000 Avios for a one-way flight from Melbourne to London. But the only way I could get it all to map together using points was to book the two flights separately and, and have a night in Doha. So how did I end up with all three seats? Well, obviously there's a bit of luck because it wasn't a full flight, but also because I booked through BA, I was allowed free seat selection with my status. And this forward cabin is marketed as some kind of premium seating cabin. Now, Qatar don't have a premium economy class, but these seats, when you're pre-booking them, are more expensive. And so the cabin is naturally less populated. And the rear of the cabin was really busy. Once everyone aboard it, it was looked almost full, but there was a completely empty row in our little forward cabin. So that's my tip. If you can stomach the cost or if you can get free seat selection with Qatar, then I found this more expensive cabin to be significantly quieter than the two cabins further back. And I was really glad to get the whole row to myself because these seats seem to feel really narrow. And according to the literature, they're 16.9 inches wide, whereas BA's seats are 17.5 inches. The seat was flush to the fuselage and the post between the seats felt like it encroached into my seat space. And I was not particularly comfortable sitting in that seat. Aside from that sort of narrow feeling, the seat's a really good product. It's got an adjustable headrest with nice stiff wings and that was really fine for napping upright. Although the seat padding kind of felt a little bit firm, a little shuffle was required every couple of hours. Uh, I used the pillow as well and that helped. The pitch of the seat felt good, better than other economy seats. It's 32 inches uh, according to the fact sheet, but it felt roomy. And the recline was also deep, 5 inches deep, which is of course a double-edged sword. A nice recline for me means the person in front will encroach further into my seat space when they recline, but I do prefer it this way because on a long flight like this, I'm sorry, I'm a recliner. The tray table is a two-stage tray table, which I prefer, but it hadn't been wiped clean and I found this to be the case for all three tray tables in my row. So I think this row had been missed by the cleaning crew. Now, there's no excuse for this, uh, but there were lots of delays in Melbourne that morning due to mist and drizzle. So it may have been that they just had a reduced time to clean the aircraft. We pushed back and began our slow taxi around the airport, but then we were held and held and held. And the delays were significant. From boarding to the plane to wheels up, it was over an hour. And from pushback with a safety video to wheels up, it was about 40 minutes. Now, incidentally, Qatar have joined the masses with revamping their safety video. And their theme is Qatar Airways around the world. Hello, Tower of London. Eventually, we climbed through what seemed to be never-ending cloud to the brilliant, brilliant skies, and shortly after this, a combined drinks and meal service began. I took a Jack Daniels and Coke to drink, and I believe I had two choices of meal, chicken or creamy pasta, and I selected the chicken. However, according to the screenshot that I took of the menu, there are actually three options in the cabin that day, so I could just be misremembering that. Although I was happy with my two choices in economy, this is something that Josh Cahill takes issue with, and he calls it underwhelming when he's comparing it to other world-class airlines. And while I enjoy my drink and eat my meal, I do want to just pause a second and ask you, what do you think about two choices in economy class? Is this standard? Or do you know you get more choices uh, in the economy cabin with other airlines? Because I was really surprised by this criticism. In any event, the meal was really good, the salad starter was tasty, the chicken was moist with a well-seasoned sauce and creamy herby mash, and the dessert was a triumph. A white chocolate mousse with Oreo cookie pieces, it was wonderful. A good and tasty economy meal and way above the quality of some of the other meals I've been served in economy, and certainly beating my economy meal expectation of safe edible food. And after all the trays had been cleared away, there was a coffee service. I had a cup of coffee and a biscuit, and it was a really nice way to round off the meal. Each seat had a small amenity kit with flight socks, eye mask, earplugs, and a toothbrush with toothpaste. And I'm not really sure how I feel about these in an economy seat. Are they a nice touch, or are they just more plastic headed for landfill? Uh, I'm not sure, but I'd like to know what your opinion is. After dinner I settled in for a little TV, I checked out the in-flight entertainment options and there was a good variety of movies and shows, uh, but this is one of four flights that I've taken with Qatar Airways and although I can't be 100% sure, I'm convinced that different aircraft on these different routes are loaded with different TV options. 
Uh, this flight seemed to have more choice than the flights I took a month earlier uh, from the UK into Bali. The headphones at Qatar provide a poor. Uh, it's difficult to compare economy headphones on a like-for-like -like basis, but these are possibly the worst headphones I've ever had in economy. They're tinny, they're light, they didn't really sit on my ear particularly well. Now, no economy headphones are going to be as good as my Bose noise-cancelling headphones, but they're usually sort of okay, and, and I wouldn't have been happy if I'd needed to use these for the whole flight. I did pay for the onboard Wi-Fi, and this was $10 US for the full 14-hour flight, and that's pretty decent, I think. I did do a broadband speed test. Of course I did. And this came in at a whopping 4.8 megabits per second, which should be just about fast enough to watch YouTube on. And time for the Lua review, and this is an area that Josh Cahill highlights as a problem on his Qatar economy flights. The first toilet he reviews is very dirty with a wet floor, but the second one seemed okay. So what was mine like? Well, it's spotlessly clean, as you can see, with some little amenities. It had a nice clean toilet, a dry floor, uh, and this was just being used by passengers. So I, th I think it's um, down to your fellow passengers more than the staff as to whether you're going to get a clean toilet or not. And on the way back from the toilet and a leg stretch, I decided to stop by the galley to see if they could get me a drink. And I was cheerfully supplied with a Jack Daniels and Coke, and they offered me some pretzels, which was a really nice touch. And then an hour or so after this, the crew came round with some snacks, and I was offered to help myself from the basket. It was another nice touch on this flight, and I sat back and enjoyed watching the sunset, which is one of my simple pleasures. And while the sun sets, let's talk about the crew. I took this flight before Josh released his video describing his troubles with the Qatar Airways communications team and his ultimate ban, so I wasn't watching the crew too closely to judge their performance, but they seemed friendly, happy in their work, efficient, busy, and very much as I'd expect an economy cabin crew to be. When we boarded, I was welcomed on board. Uh, if I said hello, someone said hello back to me. So I don't think I can agree with Josh Cahill's savage attack on the two crews that he filmed. My crew was spot on and they should be commended for a job well done. But this isn't a Qatar Airways love in, this is an honest review. Uh, I did find that two of the three US ports I had access to, they weren't working. And one that did work was running on a slow trickle charge. So there was no universal plug in the seat either. So if I'd wanted to use my laptop, uh, then I wouldn't have been able to charge it up. But I don't rely on airlines to provide me with power or entertainment or headphones, quite frankly. So with everything charging, I decided to get some sleep and try out the three seats as a bed. Even though I'm only five foot four inches tall, I still had to curl my legs to fit on. And I do wonder what the Air New Zealand sky couch would be like for sleeping on. But with my eye mask playing an audiobook, I dropped off for about three or four hours. And although I didn't feel that refreshed uh, or well rested, I had been able to get a solid sleep in. And with some napping sitting up, I felt like I'd actually managed to get a decent amount of sleep on this overnight flight. There were two further meal services on the flight, which I think is pretty decent, and th there was a light snack. Uh, and for this, I was given two options, and I took the meat pie over the creamy vegetable pie. And it was a good pie, but then I'd expect nothing else of a meat pie that's loaded aboard in Australia. If I'm going to get picky, the sausage roll that came with it was a bit greasy, it looked and tasted slightly odd, and thinking about it, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and just guess that it wasn't pork. And then we were served brunch about two hours before we landed, and I had at least two choices of omelette or beef stir-fry, and I can't remember if cinnamon toast was also an option. The fruit was good and cold and fresh, but I was not a fan of that yoghurt. I should have filmed my face for that, I bet it would have been a picture. I opted for the western style breakfast of an omelette with a sausage and this is a pretty safe bet when it comes to airline food and it didn't disappoint. Well seasoned which is often an issue I find with omelettes the sausage was good but I was not a fan of that soggy airline spinach. Blah! The meal had a couple of things that I didn't enjoy and this was partly because the yoghurt wasn't to my taste but partly because the spinach was well gross. Uh, but the meal as a whole exceeded that minimum airline food standard of clean, safe and edible. Uh, it was tasty, it was satisfying, so personally I'd award this meal, I don't know, about half marks, maybe three out of five. And it was dark as we landed so there wasn't much to see as we came in uh, but as we disembarked the plane my journey wasn't actually over because I was spending the night in Doha so I had to go through passport control which I didn't think would take too long. Most people connect through Doha and they don't go through passport control do they? 
Well, I didn't feel like getting arrested in Qatar, so I didn't record my time in immigration, but my heart sank when I saw the long snaking queue. It was slow and it was growing. I took a screenshot of the time on my phone shortly after I joined the queue, and then I took another one just after I got through the other side, and my wait was an hour and seven minutes. And because of the delay, finding my bags was a problem too. My flight wasn't on the information boards, and I was told just to wait, but that didn't sound right. Wait, I'd been an hour already. So in the end, I found my lonely suitcase going around one of the carousels. I have to say, if Qatar wants to become a tourist destination, they need to do something about their immigration. So I made my way to the taxi rank. Note those barriers for when the lines form, so queuing for a taxi at peak time seems to be common too. No queue for me though, straight to a taxi and onward to the hotel. And as I made my way across Doha, I started to think about the good and the bad of the flight. And it wasn't perfect, but this was a very good economy experience. And I would recommend Qatar Airways economy class. I could focus on the small negatives, but I chose to enjoy the bigger positives. I was well fed and watered, and I was looked after by a pleasant, efficient and professional crew. Do leave me your comments about Qatar Airways economy. And let me know what your thoughts are on Josh Cahill's video and subsequent banning. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as usual, I'm happy to answer any and all questions, so feel free to pop those in the comments. And if you'd like to see my tips on how I survive long-haul economy trips, then this is the next video that you should watch. Right, I'm off to put the kettle on. So thank you for watching and joining me on My Grey Gap Year.